Is Optimus teaching Tesla's full self-driving to drive? It actually might be the case that it is. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So yeah, that little bit of a teaser of a cold open is designed to intrigue you. <laughs> so what am I talking about specifically? Well, first of all, this is going to be incredibly speculative today because again, I don't have any inside information. But what I wanna talk about today is the control or output structure of a robot. And robots, of course, can include four-wheeled robots like cars, in addition to things like two-legged robots like Optimus. So specifically, what am I talking about? In the case of a car, I'm talking about turning the wheel, you know, right or left and or pressing the accelerator and or pressing the brake so that sort of interaction with the world so it's we're, we're separating this out from the input state right the, the the whole idea of like what's going on around me what are the cars doing what are cars what are roads what are lanes all of that stuff is kind of on the input side of things and what you do is you feed that all through and then eventually what you get to is a decision about what to do next and that decision making structure for robotics in general for many, many decades, not just recently, but Tesla has been using this too, is to have a lot of heuristics and hard-coded kinds of things that it does. There's, there's an old control system called PID, which is something with integration in the middle of it. I can't even remember what it stands for anymore. But, but anyway, this has been around for decades. It's the, it's the basic thing that allows even something like a one wheel or something like that to work or a Segway. Those kinds of, you know, those aren't really robots, but things that you stand on and they balance themselves and all of that. But then also for robotics as they're walking and they're balancing and they're driving and all of that kind of stuff is based on, you know, software 1.0, just, just code. It's probably something like C, something that's a very fast, efficient type of code and also kind of old school. But recently Elon Musk tweeted out that they were in the process of replacing a lot of that hard-coded stuff in their full self-driving beta with neural network-based control systems. And that got me thinking about whether Optimus was actually teaching teaching full self-driving to drive. And what I mean by that is that cars have, you know, it's a very complicated input structure. What is the world around me? It's very unconstrained, it's outdoors. Anything could happen, any kind of weather and stuff. When you look at a robot, it's in a much more confined environment. It's generally inside a factory in a controlled space. So the input in some way is easier. Plus it's moving much slower and it weighs a lot less. So, you know, there's a lot more room for error and not being exactly as refined and not hurting or killing somebody where you have a car and that's a significant problem for that. So the input space for a robot is relatively straightforward compared to a car in terms of a lot of that stuff. And of course, as they talked about at AI Day 1 and AI Day 2, they're utilizing Full Self Driving's vision system. They, they took that into Optimus and used that as a basis to try to get everything working so it could understand the world. And that's the gigantic advantage that Tesla has in terms of Optimus, the Tesla bot. But the opposite is really true when you look at the output part, like what does the robot do to interact with the world? That is much more complicated, right? It's got feet, two feet where it has to balance car does not have to balance. It's just sitting on the ground. <laughs> That's easy with four wheels. It, it has to use its hands to manipulate objects. It has to be able to maneuver around things. It has to be able to use tools. It has to be able to do a lot of interaction with the world that a car doesn't. You know, Scott calls it the non-interaction with the world or the negative interaction. You basically in a car do not want to interact with anything else. You want to stay far away from everything else and just stay on your own. So, so the control structure, the output structure of a robot goes from three things, from steering, you know, left, right, or braking or accelerating. There's really only three outputs that the car can do. So that's relatively straightforward. But with Optimus, we're talking about having 28 different actuators with multiple degrees of freedom per actuator. So lots and lots and lots of different potential things to move around. Think about your body, right? You know, your body doesn't just have three control structures. It has like a whole bunch for every single finger, it has your arm and the elbow, it has your head that can move around, it has your torso, it has your legs. Now, Optimus doesn't have nearly as many degrees of freedom as a human being does, but it has a lot, which means that from the get-go, or at least recently, the likelihood is that they have created kind of an overall neural network structure to do the control aspect of it. And the logic behind this is, why have one single neural network-based control structure rather than a whole bunch of individual little hard-coded components? It's because all of these things affect each other, right? Again, if I, if I move my arm out, I have to kind of subtly shift 
shift my body weight just a little bit or else I'll fall over. Now, especially if I had a, a you know 40 pound dumbbell on my arm and I picked it up, then I'd just tip over if I didn't compensate for that. So, you know, that's just a very simple example, but there's every single thing that you do with your body involves compensating for it with something else going on. So rather than having a whole bunch of disparate little bits of code that are all trying to communicate with each other and figure out what they're doing, and that of course can lead to very weird oscillating type behaviors and things like that. And you can still see that with Optimus to some extent, but rather than that, it would make much more sense to have one unified control structure and especially one that is good at statistical probabilities, which again is what neural networks are really, really good at. They're good at figuring out kind of a mean solution. And what I mean by that is average, not nasty, <laughs> but an average type of solution to a bunch of different cases using neural network weights. So you can get a very, very sophisticated response and it can behave in a very sophisticated manner with relatively, you know, not primitive, but relatively few control structures. In other words, relatively few actuators or ways of working with the world. So basically what you're doing is substituting a kind of an overarching understanding of the world in the brain rather than having a bunch of little individual things. So instead of having code just devoted to like the elbow going like this, you've got one neural network that understands what an elbow is, the input parameters, the output parameters, all of that kind of stuff is sort of rolled into one thing. And that will allow the robot to interact with the world in a much simpler way. And if you have enough data, which is always the big problem with neural networks, if you have enough data, some of which can be provided from virtualization, right? You create a billion of these virtual robots and have them do things. But then also, you know, if Randy Kirk and, and Scott Walter, and I guess me now I'm on board with this, but if the idea is that we can create multiple hundreds of these robots within the next year or so, they can actually do this in the real world too, just like cars are doing, you know, full self-driving cars are doing on the road. They're collecting data constantly. Well, the robots can collect data too. And if they can collect that real world data, they can learn to control their bodies very effectively using neural networks. And so then if we turn back to full self-driving and full self-driving beta, that was developed quite a while ago, you know, and you've got a bunch of legacy code there. And Elon Musk has talked about that, that it has legacy things that are being replaced. And one of the big legacy areas is the output control. So again, not nearly as complicated. It's just basically three degrees of freedom that it has access to. But even with that few degrees of freedom, you could see older behavior that was not very very human-like. You get these turns, like it will make a left-hand turn and it'll kind of go eh, 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 like that, right? So it'll do kind of this polygonal like <laughs> line turn thing. So you get this kind of robotic behavior in the output control that's not as smooth or natural as humans. And for those who have been fortunate enough to get uh, full self-driving beta 11.3.3, and I'm still waiting, hopefully tonight, maybe I'll get it. Anyway, but for those who've been fortunate enough, they say it drives more like a human. And that very well could not just have to do with the input Input space and understanding the world very well, but also in understanding the control structure as a kind of a, a more universal, statistically averaged kind of situation where it understands how to drive in a natural manner. And again, how do you train something like that? You just get a lot of data and you can actually record how humans drive. So the way a human might drive around, like say a pedestrian or something who's walking their dog in your street, is you do a very, very gentle maneuver early and then you come back around them. I, I'm thinking about that today because like I said, I'm still driving uh, full self-driving beta 10.69 and the car went around a pedestrian in my neighborhood today, but it went like that, like really fast. And it's not comfortable for me because it doesn't feel right. It's too aggressive. And it also didn't feel right for the pedestrian. And I felt really bad about that. Not at all unsafe, by the way, but I'm just saying it doesn't feel the kind of natural, smooth way that a human being drives. So that's the big advantage you get out of driving with something that's like a universal controller that also deals with kind of fuzzy situations. It's not giving you, you know, hard yes or no answers. It's giving you probabilities. And so it can behave in a more smooth manner as the probability that there is a pedestrian in front of you increases. It doesn't reach, it reaches a threshold, but the threshold can be a smooth threshold. It's like probably, probably, yeah, most likely, most likely. And as it does that, it can start to move out around that person and can make decisions based on probabilities rather than just sort of like instant thresholds and doing things things instantly. So it should provide for a much more smooth, natural type of driving from the output aspect of it. And it would be fairly logical to think that where they're getting this from, that the architecture of that neural network, we could be seeing a virtuous cycle going around and around between Tesla bot and full self-driving beta. 
And this could be one of those instances where TeslaBot actually learned something and they built this neural network for TeslaBot and they're like, ooh, this would probably work really, really well for the car as well. And so they can use that as inspiration or an initial model and then modify it from that to go into full self-driving beta. So again, this is just speculation. I don't have any inside information that that's how they're doing this, but it seems fairly logical that you've got the same teams working on the brains of TeslaBot and on full self-driving beta and that there would be a good deal of cross-pollination. The interesting aspect to me is that TeslaBot has something to teach full self-driving beta, not just the other way around. And I think that's pretty cool as a potentiality. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it fun and interesting and thought-provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon and also to my channel members now on YouTube. This was a relatively recent development. I just turned it on recently and a bunch of people have already joined. So if you want to join Patreon or if you want to join as a channel member, both of those are great options and I really do appreciate your support. Thank you so much. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have TeslaBot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And finally, don't forget, we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.